Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Mark Hudson, author of Titian, The Last Days. Mark is a journalist and a prize-winning author. He won the Thomas Cook Award for his travel book, Our Grandmother's Drums, and the NCR Award, the precursor of the Samuel Johnson Prize, for Coming Back Brockens, his account of a year and a mining village on the bleak east coast of Durham. His new book took him to the rather less austere setting of Venice, on the trail of Titian, the artist who many consider the finest painter of the Renaissance. Mark's book is not a conventional life, however. He places his own quest for Titian firmly in the narrative, and dares to ask questions that academic art historians might dismiss as trivial. The result is a very readable, highly unusual approach to the life and work of an artist who lived to be 90. I asked Mark to begin by telling me about Venice, the city where Titian spent most of his life. The book makes clear that the artist is quite hard to grasp in the city, though Mark left no stone unturned in trying. One of the, one of the reasons he's hard to grasp in Venice is because the, the, the tradition of Venetian artists was that, was that they worked for the many institutions in Venice which patronised artists, like obviously the church, the many churches, the, the, the noble families, and the, 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 the chari- great charitable brotherhoods. Hmm. Which with the Scuole Grande, which in Titian's time were setting up magnificently endowed institutions with vast numbers of paintings, and that the, and traditionally the painters of Venice really occupied themselves with working for these institutions very lucratively. Hmm. So if you're going if you're going to Venice, if you want to look at Tintoretto, you'll see immense rooms absolutely full of his stuff. Mm. I mean, I think it was Ruskin said, you cannot really appreciate Tintoretto without going to Venice. I think the same is true of Bellini. Bellini was Titian's great teacher. Tintoretto was Titian's successor. Those artists, you really can sort of read them as you walk around Venice. Titian, the, he was the first artist to really transcend Venice as a market. He, he got immensely wealthy patrons outside Venice. So a lot of his work was going out of Venice, wasn't it? He became too big for Venice very early in his career. And as a result of that, a lot of his greatest work isn't in Venice or it's dotted around in funny places. I mean, there's maybe five really, really great Titian paintings in Venice. Whereas, you know, we've got a large number of them in London too, in Madrid, Florence, all these different places. Yeah. And I think even in Titian's lifetime, funnily enough, because he, but although he was the greatest artistic celebrity in Venice for most of his career, he was kind of neglected in a strange way because he was sending all the work outside the country. Mm. So people didn't really know what he was doing. So he was thought of as a kind of a sort of artist of the past, even when he was still alive. In a funny way, that still applies. He's a very elusive character. And to kind of get a grip on him in Venice, you really have to kind of let your imagination flow a bit. From the book, it's clear that Titian was quite a smart operator. He wasn't a sort of innocent genius, unaware of his own market value. And I was quite amused by his freelance approach to business, whereby he would start off a commission and then move on to another one, and um, much in the same way as uh, contemporary builders do. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he had a business which he needed to keep going. I mean, the great difference between him and the artists of later centuries, or the artists of his time and the next great period, is that he didn't operate through dealers. Mm. You know, he had his own shop. I mean, the term bottega, the Italian for a workshop or studio, is, a, is, is the same as the word for a shop. So if you wanted to deal with him, you went straight to him. And the, the idea, you know, the idea of the alienated tragic artist in his garret, you know, which, which, which is, it still dominates our idea of what an artist is like, as Van Gogh being the greatest example, who's kind of powerless because he's reliant on, will the dealer take my stuff? I mean, Titian wasn't like that. He had a, a thriving business. And like any, any freelance business, you have to have a kind of steady flow of work. So this did leave some of his clients absolutely exasperated you know, threatening legal action, God knows what, to get, in, to get into finally complete things, which sort of dragged on for years. He would start something in a great blast of energy to get the initial commission and the, few, the huge advance to get the thing started. Mm. Then he just sort of put it away for a couple of years, maybe years, while he went off and did other things. Yeah. He was juggling commissions from extremely wealthy, powerful, potentially dangerous people, not the sort of people, you know, dukes and emperors and popes. 
And he also had a com uh, um, an obligation to the Venetian state. Quite early in his career, he was given a, a sanseria, which is a kind of government sinecure, a kind of pension, an annual, an, annual, an annual sum of money in return for doing paintings for official buildings. And he, he, he got this by pr promising a battle scene for the Duke's Doge's Palace, that magnificent building in Venice. It took him 20 years before he even started it. And then he only started it because they threatened that he, A, he would lose his sanseria, and B, he'd have to pay back every single penny he'd, be, he'd been paid. But I, mean, I think if you want to look for what really motivated Titian as a painter, it's A, ambish, pure material ambition, and B, perfectionism. He would not let a painting go until it was absolutely as good as he can get it. Mm.